So when I first started thinking about the ways in which the aftermath of the pandemic could lead the field of music education to rectify a historical absence of popular musicians as qualified educators, my mind immediately went to Bourdieu. In particular, Bourdieu's concept of hysteresis, which posits that as the knowledges and skills required in a particular field alter, as they had when learning was forced online, paradigmatic change becomes more likely. It was at this point that I wrote and submitted my abstract to this conference. But as I began to interrogate this idea, I noticed that music scholars using sociological theory to explore the absence of popular musicians in school classrooms, particularly theories from Bourdieu, tended to focus on institutional factors which prevent popular musicians from gaining access to teacher education programs. And I can understand this logic. Many of these authors are professors in music teacher education programs, speaking to readers who are in music teacher education programs, who have an influence over the drafting of new policy within music teacher education programs. And notably, Bourdieu's theories, particularly those of hysteresis and reproduction, were developed with the university directly in mind. But at the multidisciplinary conference, I asked them serves as a space in which concepts and ideas not immediately associated with music education can begin to inform the thinking of music education scholars. We in the field of music teaching have been using Bourdieu to problematize the absence of popular musicianship from schools for well over a decade, yet the problem still remains. But the presenters here at IASPM are less impeded by this institutional bubble and are therefore more likely to explore factors which influence a popular musician's life career and music outside of formal institutions. This has inspired me to bring a new theoretical lens to this presentation, one that is rarely engaged with by music education scholars, that of life course analysis. Now before I unpack the tenets of life course analysis here, I want to answer a glaring question which serves as the impetus for going on this theoretical journey at all. Why is the field of music education so in need of popular musicians as classroom educators? Well, pedagogical methods stemming from the practices of popular musicians, as well as the curricular inclusion of popular music in schools, is shown to increase student engagement, retention, psychosocial well-being, and the diversity of a class, whilst reducing truancy and the presence of behavioural issues. However, many in-service educators solely receive instruction regarding the implementation of large ensemble rehearsals and a focus on developing art musicianship or knowledge of art musics both as school students themselves and in teacher education programs. To put it bluntly, we've found a method of music education stemming from the discourse of the popular musicianship that students love and respond to. However, many classroom teachers are solely classically trained and report feeling unprepared to implement these methods within their own practice. The presence of popular musicians within both the classrooms and staff rooms of schools may aid in the increased implementation of these methods. Those who have curated successful careers as popular musicians are likely to already hold a knowledge of music technology, tropes of popular music genres, be multi-instrumentalist on popular music instruments, and have a knowledge of the digital recording process, all of which Green and Williams and Randalls argue are necessary to implement these methods in schools. Further, these musicians may serve as points of contact for other in-service educators, to ask questions and seek guidance regarding the discourses of popular musicianship. So what is this life course analysis? Well, Moen and Hernandez argue that life course scholars theorize about lives in context, examining historical, cultural and structural risks, resources and constraints, shaping life changes and life quality. In doing so, the time at which major life transitions occur, things like having children or entering a university program, the sequence or order in which they take place, and the duration of time spent within these life stages are positioned as important. And so when understanding factors which may inform a professional popular musician's likelihood of gaining music teacher qualifications, all of these factors must be considered. Within the context of music education, particularly in North America, it's notable that age and institutional expectations have created a so-called normal pathway to becoming a music teacher, with relatively homogeneous timings, sequencing, things, and duration of life events. It often looks like this, where one studies music education at secondary school in order to meet audition criteria, to enter university degree program, to then gain a bachelor in music or music education before entering teacher's college, and then they begin their teaching career. This is what we label a life course trajectory, with one's next life course event implied by their previous experiences. 
Once entering a Bachelor of Music Education, the logical next step is to enter Teachers College and then to become a qualified teacher. That is your trajectory. Importantly, this life course is also teleological. The order is set and rigid. You can't enter Teachers College without gaining a Bachelor qualification or become a teacher before you've gained these degrees. We're considering Wright and Powell et al's observation that popular musicianship remains largely absent from the curriculum of both secondary and university music programs. This life course structure may see music teachers enter a classroom with little knowledge of or exposure to popular musicianship. So this pathway affords little to no time for guided exploration of popular musicianship outside of an institution, and thus educators are likely to enter the field of music education with no knowledge of professional musicianship outside of a largely institutionalized art music dominant curriculum experience within their own secondary school programs, university and or teachers college. As noted before, this contributes to many music teachers feeling unprepared to use pedagogical methods associated with popular musicianship and may even discourage them from introducing popular music into the classroom as curricular material. As Williams and Randalls put it, to do so often proves to be a difficult task as they have never been asked to do such a thing before in their musical lives. In comparison, the life course of successful professional musicians necessitates the development of a knowledge associated with popular musicianship. However, this life course is likely to be significantly less rigid and teleological. Cruz and Green note that the limited impact of institutionalization on the career prospects of popular musicians may play a role in this. Green's study of the learning practices of popular musicians found that the dominance of art music within the schooling lives of these musicians for many of them developing high levels of popular musicianship outside of formal classroom spaces. Similarly, Herbst and Albrecht note that professional session musicians working within popular genres do not feel that possessing a bachelor's qualification in music necessarily advantages one musician over another. Thus, exposure to formal tuition in music education and the gaining of institutional recognition of learning in the form of high school certificates or tertiary degrees is positioned as holding less value within the field of popular musicianship when compared to the fields of art music and music education. In Bordesian terms, we would say that these qualifications hold less symbolic capital within the field of popular musicianship. As a result, the sequencing and pacing of the life course of popular musicians is more likely to be heterogeneous in comparison to that associated with formerly qualified music teachers. These musicians may enter the professional field while still in high school, or they may do so after graduating, if choosing to graduate at all. They may engage with school-level music education, or they may perceive this as irrelevant or unnecessary to their career trajectory. They may choose to begin a popular music-focused tertiary program, or they may decide not to, with little influence on their chances of gaining employment as professional popular musicians in the future. There exists increased flexibility in the potential life course pathways when comparing the trajectory of popular musicians to the average music teacher. Notably, a music teacher's life course is not only more institutionalised, but also dictated by inflexible governmental policy. Teachers must meet the standards for licensure before teaching in a classroom across the majority of school districts. And these standards require you to have undertaken this sequence of life course events. As a result, professional popular musicians who may consider a career as a music teacher must begin this process from the start. They must train to meet audition criteria, complete a bachelor's qualification, enter teacher's college, and then meet the licensure requirements. This process can take between five and six years, time in which they're unable to work in the music industry to the same extent as they could have prior to entering full-time study. Though there exists much scholarly literature problematizing factors within this process, which may prevent popular musicians from succeeding whilst choosing to pursue the trajectory of a music educator, there exists almost no writing exploring non-institution specific factors which may prevent a popular musician from even considering undertaking this process in the first place. This leads us to discuss the concept of reversibility. In the context of life course analysis, the concept of reversibility refers to the extent to which one feels able to alter their life course trajectory once they've begun on a particular pathway. Many factors inform the perceived reversibility of a life course trajectory, including financial independence, spousal or parental responsibilities, and age expectation. An often cited passage from Ryder argues that the potential for change is concentrated in the cohort of young adults, who are old enough to participate directly in the movement impelled by change, but not old enough to have become committed to an occupation, a residence, 
a family of procreation or a way of life. It is not to argue that changes in career, occupation and life course trajectory are not possible for older adults. Rather, the concept of reversibility posits that factors which may negatively impact a person's willingness to make such a decision are likely to compound over time and encourage them to remain on the life course trajectory they are currently on. As a general rule, the more financial and personal responsibility you have to others, including to loan lenders, spouses, children or colleagues, the less likely you are to consider making major alterations to your life course trajectory. For example, a 30-year-old professional musician earning a stable income who has recently taken out a home loan and has begun supporting a small family on just their income may not feel as if they have the financial or personal freedom to enter full-time study at this time. Conversely, a childless, unpartnered 30-year-old with a significant amount of financial savings may see the possibility of leaving the workforce to gain a teaching qualification as viable. For the latter, the reversibility of their life course trajectory, which implies that once you enter the workforce, you'll remain there until retirement, is perceived as higher than that of the former. When examining the typical life course of a qualified music teacher, we know that the decision to begin this five to six year study pathway without the possibility of gaining full-time income often begins soon after one has graduated high school as a teenager. Now this is a period where you're likely to have less financial or a personal responsibility to others. On the other hand, popular musicians are more likely to enter the professional field immediately out of high school and thus spend this late adolescence period in the workforce. As a result, those who have curated a career as a professional popular musician are likely to consider becoming a qualified music teacher at a later age than the average. In this position, these figures are more likely to be influenced by age expectations, which encourage them to take on responsibilities which impact life course reversibility. Unlike age norms, which set legal and social boundaries met with sanctions if not adhered to, like the legal age of marriage, Citizen notes that the age expectations exert influence via informal social controls, which are more covert in nature. Societal discourses which imply that one should have graduated from schooling, found a life partner, got married or had, had children by a particular age, are likely to push individuals to take on such responsibilities as they grow older. Though not meeting these expectations might not lead to formal sanctions, feelings of guilt, inadequacy or social exclusion associated with doing so are likely to influence one's aspirations and behaviour. Thus, the further one gets from adolescence, the more likely they are, to, they are to take on roles which highlight responsibility to others and impact life course reversibility, such as homeowner, spouse or parent. It's worth noting that adolescence isn't the only point in one's life course associated with less personal or financial responsibility to others. Those with adult children who have less than nests or those who own their own homes, usually in mid to late adulthood, have already met or subverted many age expectations which impact reversibility. Thus, these figures may be more likely to consider gaining new qualifications or entering a new career field. These folks may be ex-professional popular musicians or maybe people who have had the time to curate an understanding of popular musicianship across their life course. Either way, there's currently little literature exploring the experiences of these prospective music teachers within and outside of the institution. Now, though all of this makes it seem like those who are not young or those who are middle ages who do not decide to become music teachers as soon as they finish high school have little chance of ever doing so, COVID-19 may undermine this. The godfather of life course theory, Glenn Elder, notes that large-scale social, economic or health-related events that impact a large number of people, what are labelled as period effects, may lead people to make changes to their life course in ways not previously anticipated. Though Elder initially explored these concepts in relation to the impact of the Great Depression, life course theorists have already labelled the pandemic and policies relating to social distancing, working from home, and travel bans as a large-scale period effect. There are already hundreds of articles exploring the extent to which educational practices put in place during the pandemic may have long-term impacts on the field of education specifically. However, there is almost no literature exploring the ways in which the impacts of COVID-19 may serve as an opportunity for the field of music education to address the exclusion of popular musicians and mitigate factors which impact the reversibility of a popular musician's life course trajectory. 
it is undeniable that the creative sector and musicians in particular were hit hard by the pandemic. With early articles positioning singing, dancing, and wind instrument playing as factors which may spread the virus at higher rates, musical performances were some of the first events to be cancelled in response to the threat of COVID-19. Looney and the I Lost My Gig initiative note that some musicians lost up to two years of performance bookings in one week when venue and capacity limits and social distancing measures were announced, and many still report a struggle to book shows more than a few months in advance. With over 50% of respondents to a 2021 I Lost My Gig survey noting that they are considering working in a non-creative sector due to the financial instability prompted by COVID-19, Policy is exploring how musicians can be financially and professionally supported during and after the pandemic required. Referencing the pandemic specifically, Citizen et al. argue that millions of displaced workers will require retraining, skill upgrading and new degrees, enabling movement into both sectors. We're noting that popular musicians are likely to possess skills and knowledges considered valuable when employing pedagogical methods associated with popular musicianship, Perhaps policies encouraging professional musicians to consider retraining as qualified music educators are needed. Many nations are reporting large-scale teacher shortages, and the field of music education has long hold for more diverse voices to enter the field, so now seems like a better time than ever. Not only do pandemic-related policies have the chance to illuminate the presence of potential teachers within the professional musician community, but they may see professional musicians more likely to consider making major shifts in their life course trajectory. Factors which may have once inhibited the perceived reversibility of a decision to pursue a professional career rather than enter a university program may be mitigated by pandemic measures. Financial and social responsibilities which may have discouraged musicians from pausing full-time employment to enter teacher education programs may now see musicians likely to consider seeking a more stable career pathway, particularly when realising the number and scale of performance cancellations possible within a short time. Similarly, a hyper-awareness of one's physical health in response to the pandemic may see those who are self or casually employed more likely to consider a career which provides adequate health care coverage and or paid sick leave. A lack of regular income during pandemic times may see the financial impact of entering full or part-time university study less severe, with the option of working in the music industry during this time often impossible anyway. Relatedly, the normalisation of online learning during this time may allow musicians to continue taking on parenting or spousal roles while studying in ways not possible during in-person learning. Thus, factors once considered negatively impacting the reversibility of a musician's life course trajectory may instead influence them to seriously consider entering a new career. A move into qualified music teaching may be an enticing option, particularly when noting that many professional musicians are likely to teach private lessons already. With a newfound motivation to seek employment beyond casual and contract work, the increased presence of policies mandating that all music tutors in schools be qualified music teachers, calls for the increased use of methods stemming from the practices of popular musicians in classrooms, and COVID-19 policies mitigating a perceived lack of reversibility of one's life course trajectory, now may be the best time yet to encourage professional musicians to consider a career as a school music teacher. So how can we make this possible? Well, we could offer financial support to mature age students to mitigate the financial impact of entering university later in life. This could take the form of government grants, institutional scholarships, tax credits, or even reduced childcare rates. Thinking about financial factors which impact the reversibility of a musician's life course trajectory specifically and exploring policies to redress such issues may be necessary. We could also attempt to make the process of gaining a music teaching qualification shorter for those who can demonstrate an understanding of musical concepts despite not holding institutional qualifications. This could see the influence of financial pressures and age expectations having less impact on a musician's decision to pursue a licensure. This poses many questions which would need to be investigated and explored by music education scholars, including how we can assess potential gaps in this musical knowledge and ways to ensure that musicians are also prepared to teach non-popular musics if they enter school classrooms. We could also encourage institutions to continue offering online learning as an option to students who benefit from this flexibility. 
This may allow for those with parental responsibilities or those in non-metropolitan areas to see the undertaking of a degree program as possible for them. These are just a handful of ideas, but they are all initiatives that can be implemented, influenced and advocated for by academics in music education. The exploration of factors inside of the institution, which influences a person's likelihood of gaining teaching qualifications, must be paired with explorations of factors outside of the institution, which have similar effects, if academics are able to use their power, knowledge and position to advocate for real change. I believe that life course analysis lends an invaluable insight into this process.